Roll for Crit is made possible thanks to the support of viewers like you and our patrons on our Patreon page. You can become a patron for just $1 a month at patreon.com slash rollforcrit. Welcome to Roll for Crit. Today we are hanging out with Travis from Queen Games, and you guys always have uh, a bunch of interesting new titles in the works. Thank you for joining us. In particular today, we are hoping to talk about the upcoming Stefan Feld City Collection, which by the time you're watching this is probably on Kickstarter right now, at least its first iteration. So why don't we start there? Could you explain to us what this collection is exactly and how it came to be? Yeah, sure thing. First, thrilled to be here, so thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. um, the Stefan Feld City Collection is a huge project we've been working on now for for well over a year. Um, I, I, I think most board gamers are at least familiar with Stefan Feld and many of them are like dedicated fans of his. He has a huge catalog of games. Some of them are older games that are not readily available. Uh, and some of them of course are newer games. Some of those older games, um, we sat down and talked with him about the idea of reimagining them and re-implementing them into new versions, uh, in a collection that, features cities from around the world. So that's kind of where the name comes from. And it, the city collection is going to be a nice blend of both re-implementations of uh, existing games and brand new games as well. So, for example, you mentioned the first iteration. Uh, when As we're recording this, we're a day. We launch tomorrow, so I think for sure it'll be live. Mm -hmm. The first campaign features Hamburg and Amsterdam, and Hamburg re-implements Bruges, which is a beloved Feld game, and Amsterdam uh, re-implements Macau, which is likewise the same. So both of them have seen um, revisions, development, additions of content. Uh, he has worked closely with our developers to make some changes. I mean, I have to imagine, and I've spoken with him about it some, but I have to imagine that if you design a game that's as beloved as that over a decade ago, over that time, you probably think, you know, if I had a chance to do this over again mm -hmm. or make these changes, I might have done it this way. And we think that the City Collection offers that great opportunity to make some changes. So anyone familiar with those games will certainly recognize that those are rooted in the games, um, but they will also see that it is they're going to be different, different. They're not going to be the same. It's not just a, a reprint for sure. Actually, I wanted to ask about that because we, it, reprints are not new to the board game world where you see an old game brought back with maybe some slight tweaks, but you use the word re-envision and even changing the names. When do you decide that this is different enough that it needs a whole new name or was it just a new name because you're like, yeah, that way we can visit that city for research? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish I was getting to visit Marrakesh and Amsterdam <laughs> and all that on, on the company, but um, I think we liked the idea of featuring... Uh, cities from around the world in our art. So the next two games will be New York City and Marrakesh. So we're not like drilled in on Europe. We're looking around the world. We want to feature cities. Uh, some of the cities we feature will have been featured in other games and some of them will not have. So we like that idea. It gives us a lot of um, artistic flexibility to where we can feature different cityscapes. Um, I don't know if you've seen the promotion we did on social media, but all the boxes, when you stack them vertically side by side, will line up to be a cityscape panorama that flows from Hamburg to Amsterdam to New York City to Marrakesh and beyond to some of you know, the other games. Um, so it's a really neat artistic blending of all those different cities. So that was part of the name change. And I think you touched on the other part. I mean, we're not remaking Bruges. So why we wouldn't want to call it Bruges because it is a different game. I don't know how familiar you are with Bruges, but for example, just a high level uh, explanation of some of the big changes in Bruges, you have two decks of cards and you're drawing from either deck looking for certain colored cards because you need that color to do a certain thing. He's broken that out into where into decks to where each color has its own deck. So instead of hunting for a card, you're taking the card color that you want so you can more strategically plan around what you're going to do. And also the game used to be a random game length that would end based upon the exhaustion of cards, whereas now it's a specific number of game turns. So that results in a, a significant change in how you approach things. 
So it sounds like these could, they're different enough that they can even live alongside the original versions of the game. You don't have to choose one or the other. Yeah, certainly. I, I, I don't think that they in any way replace them, although we hope that we're creating a better game. <laughs> um, in, in our eyes, uh, hopefully it's a product that, that fans will view as being an improvement upon the original. I have seen some people selling Bruges and Macau in preparation uh, on various forums and, and stuff. So hopefully we don't disappoint any of them. I, th I don't think we will. I think everyone will be happy. <laughs> yeah, and we love the idea, I know, of, of uh, having it on your shelf displayed so it all makes a nice picture. Anytime there's like a set of games that look good together, <laughs> that really makes us happy. <laughs> Yeah, that was at Gen Con last year. We had a big conversation. We talked about it with Stefan, and um, that was one of the big things we came out of is, man, it would be awesome if we can make all the boxes line up to have a continual panorama, and that's been one of our big focuses. We're really, really excited about that. Um, and then the this was a good conversation we had with our owner. We're including game trays. Uh, are you guys familiar with game? Yeah, yeah the game yeah. tray product. Yeah. So we're including game trays in all of the city collection, because as I pointed out, you can't encourage people to stack their games vertically unless you give them some sort of way to contain those components. Otherwise, the components are going to be everywhere, right? <laughs> so stack them vertically. You got to have something like game trays to hold on to the stuff. Or you can be like me and put everything in so many baggies that you open it up and half of it's plastic. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I've got a lot of those. But even with the plastic, everything would fall to the bottom. And yeah, yeah. So we thought game trays was the way to go. That is a nice touch. And uh, I know you can't maybe, maybe you can't tell us the answer to this, but do you have a favorite in the collection so far? Well, so there's only two games in the collection so far. If I were to pick a favorite of the two, <laughs> I own Bruges already. I was asked this the other day, which would you pick if you had to pick two? So I do own Bruges, but I don't own Macau. If I had to pick between the two, I'd go Amsterdam. But um, yeah, I think equally, they're both excellent games. I mean, if you go beyond those two, we, we haven't really, we haven't announced on tomorrow. We will be announcing the next two games as well so people will know what, what what's going to be available and we have some pledge levels that will allow people to get more than just the first two games sort of signing on ahead of time mm. and it, there's some good incentives that include uh signatures and numbered editions and things like that that are an incentive to come early um so we'll be telling them that so it's hard. I mean, it's just picking between two games right now, right? Um, I mean, I love a lot of Feld games. People are kind of surprised when I say we have a lot of Feld games in our lineup. We have Merlin and Amerigo mm. and Roma, which is an older game, and it happens, and a very hard to find game called Dribble Fever, which is a soccer game featuring what was a soccer star in Germany. I guess he was an up and coming star a decade ago or longer or whenever um, they made the game. And now it's like a big deal. But um, so that one's even, we have all those, but I, if I were to pick my favorite, I always say in the year of the dragon. I don't know if you guys know that game, no. but um, that's not even a game of, of Queens. And, uh, and actually it won't, it won't be part of the collection. People keep asking about <laughs> like, Oh, it's castles of Burgundy going to be part of the collection. <laughs> right. Well, no, that's a, that's in print right now. And <laughs> I don't, don't expect that to change anytime soon. So. If only, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you'd love to get your hands <laughs> right. on all of them. Uh, you know, we're, and we're talking, sure. about, yeah, we're, yeah, we're talking about uh, Stefan Feld, obviously, and he is a an extremely prodigious, a very well known designer, and big enough. You know, there aren't many designers out there that you could say, "Oh, let's take uh, a lot of your games and some new ones and make a whole collection out of them." What do you think it is about his designs and his games that people? find so compelling that makes them exciting enough that a project like this can come together? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I think I've gotten some insight into that from him himself recently. Uh, we've done some Q and A's like we did a AMA um, on Reddit about a week ago. And you know, that's just hundreds of questions mm -hmm. and we worked with him. He's a native German speaker. He speaks English, but you know, typing it and everything's a different, a different idea. Mm -hmm. So we worked with him and some of the answers he gave to some of the questions give some good insight into that. Like, for example, people asked about him using his mechanics or would you ever use this in another game? And his answer was, I don't like to repeat myself. I don't like to take from one of my games and, and make it into a different game. Um, 
So I, I like to kind of reinvent things as I go. So I think he does a great job of using a lot of different mechanics, you know, whether it's worker placement or dice rolling or kind of a unique twist on dice or multi-purpose cards, um, action selection. There's just all sorts of good blends there. And he does it in a way that accommodates so many different strategies because in his games, there's so many different ways to score points, as everybody knows, right? Mm -hmm. They call him the point salad guy, right? <laughs> For sure. Um, so there's so many ways to score that it creates so many different valid approaches to how you can play the game. And he also al almost always balances that out with, uh, if you don't take care of this, then there are going to be problems for you. Like in his classic Notre Dame, you have to deal with rats. And in our game, Merlin, you have to deal with the upstart uh, knights that come and attack your castles. I mean, there, he always does a good job of saying, yeah, you can take all these things and score points how you want, but if you overlook these things, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good to have that. Uh, that freedom, I think, is uh, definitely part of the appeal that you can and, and that you can explore a lot of different strategies every time you play. And there's not necessarily one path that everyone must go down. You can kind of put your finger in a lot of different pies. Um, I want to go back to the Kickstarter itself, too. You, were, you kind of started to talk a little bit about some of the options that you might have. But I'm wondering if these games will be available, uh, e readily available after the Kickstarter campaigns. And you also talked about that there would be some kind of an option to opt in for future releases. Will there be like a, a big thing where you can just get sign up for all eight of the games at once so you know you'll have that full collection? So we had a lot of discussion about that, and there were times. Right now, we've announced there will be at least eight, eight more than eight of these games. Oh yeah, eight plus. So we've had a lot. Of, we had a lot of talk about should we allow people to go in for eight? And at the end of the day, we decided it, not to go a full eight for a couple of reasons. One, it's a big, it's a big number for someone if you're getting eight games. And then the other side of it is, things are changing so much in the world right now, and you know, in our industry that costs are going up, shipping charges are going up. I mean, the COVID is driving a lot of that, mm -hmm. surcharges for different things. Like, And we have, for example, several Kickstarters that are outstanding. It's still, they're not past due or anything, but to be fulfilled, well, we've already charged shipping for those. If we didn't charge enough, because and under the new operating procedures, which we're all dealing with, then that's on us, right? So we just kind of thought if we push things down the road where we're letting people buy something that's not going to get sent to them for two years or three years, then we could be getting into trouble for ourselves. And I mean, the nature of things like that is if shipping costs go up because of COVID, when COVID goes away, that increase doesn't go away, right? I mean, mm. you guys probably remember when gas prices were up at $4 or more mm -hmm. and all the pizza places started charging delivery charges, right, on on top of everything. Mm -hmm. Well, gas was down to a buck and a quarter not long ago, and we're still paying that delivery charge, right? <laughs> I mean, that never went away, and that, that's the nature of business, right? Once it gets, they get something, it doesn't go anywhere, Um so we decided to go, you're going to be able to get the first four games. So you'll have the first two and then the next two, which is, uh, like I said, New York City and Marrakesh. And um, there are some neat options where you can get all four of them together. And if you do that early, there's going to be autographed options. I mentioned some numbering. Um, there also will be an option. There's going to be a limited number of them. Um, and we may or may not sell them all in this campaign, but there will be a number, limited number where if you get a certain number, say you get 247 out of 1,000, then on five and six, you have the option to maintain. It's basically <laughs> reserved for you. So you would have the same numbered version of the game for the entire collection if you choose to maintain that, which I think is a pretty neat thing, especially for collectors, right? Um, yeah. And then we'll have some other numbered ones, but they'll be a little more random as far as what you get. But there will be some options to maintain uh, and get that same limited collector's number. Um, we, we are offering both. I think we've shared all the covers for both, both a classic version that has what people would see as like the classic queen art. And then we're also offering a deluxe version that has a different art. It's more of a minimal art with uh, nice... Um, embossed gold printing on it um 
it just offers a different view. That's and that's going to be a deluxe version of the game. It's going to have upgraded components, um, all sorts of different different now, options. Would that deluxe version still make the panorama that we were talking about earlier with the boxes? And would it have to be with all other deluxe ones? Yeah, so, um, and they'll know this by the time it comes out, but so the deluxe version has the deluxe on the front. It's got the name of the game and like a nice embossed tower that represents the building that we featured in the city. And on the back, there's actually going to be a night view of the city. So the, the classic cover, which you may have seen, it'll be a night view of that same cover. And on the side, there will be a night panorama. But the deluxe version comes with a box sleeve that also gives you the classic cover and the daytime view, uh, panorama on the side. So whatever you want to display on your shelf, you've got you've got options. Okay, that's that's good because you want to keep that because, like we said, we like that idea, and I love the collector number thing too. Though I want to imagine someone was like, I want number one in the first one, but then number two <laughs> in the second one, and then three and then four. <laughs> oh boy, that's the ultimate. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of crazy things going on with the collectors out there. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. You 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 know you mentioned how obviously things have been shaken up a little bit recently, especially as pertains to Kickstarter. And you know, you guys do a lot of Kickstarter stuff. And also, you know, just God, what was it? Feels like feels like seven months ago now, but I think it was like two weeks ago. Was Gen Con online, and that was a big difference this year. Uh, how did you? What was your Queen Games experience with Gen Con online, and just with how everything else has been happening lately? So, Queen Games is traditionally very non-existent in the digital game market, right? We have very few games that have been out there historically available to play online. This pandemic has served as a good catalyst for me to convince our owner that we have to remedy that situation. And we've been aggressively dealing with that. We, we've got two games that are almost done on Board Game Arena, um, we've got several games we rolled out mods for recently for Tabletop Simulator. And specifically, we'd have Winter Kingdom, which is the sort of sequel to Kingdom Builder from Donald Vaccarino. And then we had another title of ours called Zen Garden. We got those up and running for Gen Con for the purpose of being able to demo games. So doing that in the digital space is kind of new for us. So we didn't submit any events for Gen Con because we weren't 100% sure what all was going to be ready and I didn't want to submit an event for something we didn't have. So that's just kind of a precursor to answering your question. So <laughs> I felt like the events for Gen Con were very successful. I saw a lot of people talking about them, attending them, things were sold out. I, I know that they had a lot of people participate in those. I think in hindsight, if we had run events, it would have been a little better for us. As it was, our participation was basically limited to if people go to the Gen Con site and make their way to the looking glass, did you guys experience the looking glass? We did, we did. yeah. Okay. So then you might be able to find the company you're looking for. I, it was a little d difficult. I mean, the search engine they had was not real easily explained. They, there were some options there. Like you could search for tags, like you could search for board games and it would show you all the companies that had the board game tag, but there wasn't really anything telling you that. So, and then this is just a personal critique, but they randomly distributed all the companies. Oh around yeah. The board. No, I, I completely agree. They were all different sizes based on your booth. But so we were at the, if you looked at it as a clock, we were at the very bottom of six o'clock. So when you went in and you zoomed all the way out, you still couldn't see us and you had to grab the screen and drag it up unless you had a bigger monitor, like some of the huge monitors you could see. Um, so it, to me, it just wasn't super easy to understand how to find stuff. And that was reflected. Our The people who made their way to our Discord server, basically, if you clicked on our promotional card, it would bring you to our Discord server at a cell we were doing for Gen Con. And once you were in our Discord server, we would engage with you and chat or demo games or whatever you wanted to do. They said they had 41,000 people hit the looking glass and we had about 60 people make their way to our Discord server. Mm. So to me, that's a very low conversion rate. So they, they clearly, they have a lot 
go, did they need to do to improve it if they continue to do a digital event? We enjoyed it. We enjoyed the people we did talk to. We enjoyed being in the digital platform. Um, but the traffic was was pretty low. It sounds like maybe you experienced some of the roughness of the looking glass as well. I mean, I get conceptually like it's I think it was designed by an artist who's like, this looks really cool, you know, different sizes and spread it everywhere. But it's very random, like you said, and it's not like, oh, the artists are over here, you know, the independents are over there. They're spreading them out equally. Yeah. When, if, you know, when you when uh, in physical Gen Con, you know, I can snake the aisles relatively easy or alphabetically look up through the book. So I think they could have done maybe something a little bit better mm-hmm. on, uh, on the organization front. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I, I don't want to disparage anyone. There are companies that have bigger booths than us and smaller booths. But the idea that you've got someone that has a tiny booth and a tiny icon right beside the middle where it's zoomed in when you begin. And when you look at their their promotional card, they are clearly not actively participating in Gen Con online. Hmm. A lot of the companies weren't. You, you saw that they didn't have any description or anything, and their avatar was just a stock Gen Con avatar choice that you have on the website. Hmm. That tells me they weren't participating. For them to be right in the middle, and then you have active companies out in the perimeter, and people can't even can't even find them. To me, just the random element of it just made it very rough. And I have to think that location was a big driver on traffic. Um, so it was it was a learning experience, right? Um, I, think I mean, it's for everyone, for yeah, us. everyone was right. I think one of the funny things, though, uh, at the very end of the convention, uh, Jonathan and I went on. You found Jonathan, you found a Minecraft server, <laughs> yes, the, that well, someone had actually built. Yeah, it was part of the Gen throughout Con. the convention. Yeah, they had a recreation of the Indianapolis Convention Center, <laughs> and, and I think it was easier for us to find booths there. Like we actually were like, oh, here, well, that's the Pokemon booth, and over here, this is, I think, uh, this is Pathfinder. You know, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's neat. Are you, have you guys used the interactive Gen Con exhibitor map before? Uh, probably, but they have one every year where you can like find people on a list or search for them or scroll an actual map of the hall. Probably like on like the app and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why they didn't just use that because then you could have put people's logos on their booth and people like if people are queen games fans, they're going to find us on the internet, whether Gen Con directs them there or not. Right. But the people who show up at the show and know our booth by where it's located and what our booth staff are wearing and the games that we make, Mm -hmm. but may not know the name, those are the people you're looking to find at a convention, right? So, I mean, people who could have gone on a map and found it because they know where it is based on previous years, to me, that would have been a much better way to do it. I mean, it wouldn't have looked like a galaxy that was all, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's definitely, a, it's it, there's growing pains for sure. It's, it's surprising to me to hear that for, you know, a company that is, I, feel, I think, to me at least, Queen Games is one of the more prominent game companies out there, uh, one of the bigger names. So to hear that you were impacted by that negatively, it's not like they uh, prioritized larger companies or something they this just sounds like it was just randomly <laughs> assigned like you said yeah, they told me they told me that it was definitely random they had a short list of people that they placed intentionally because they were either doing massive contri- contributions to the event or to gen con in general um and then everyone else is random and i don't have a yeah. problem with that like for example bgg did a live stream throughout the entire show Placing their logo close to the middle to me, that makes sense to me. But after that, I trust me, I they they've received an email from me that, hmm. that outlines numerous ways they could have chose to place everyone that would have been superior to random. I mean, <laughs> every company that goes to Gen Con collects what they call priority points. It's based upon how long you've been going and how much you spend each year on your booth and advertising and stuff. To me, that's a natural way to have placed people or if you wanted it to be fair to everybody, then tell them up front, the sooner you commit to your promotional card, meaning the sooner you activate yourself and say you're going to participate, the better placement you'll have. You know, And then everybody has a equal footing on getting a location. So there were a lot of different ways they could have done it. Random, to me, random was both the easiest way on them and the worst result. 
Yeah, I think that's a, that's a fair assessment. Assessment. Uh, well, <laughs> let, let's pretend that we're at Gen Con. Let's imagine that we have somehow we're in a universe where there was a real Gen Con and we got to go to your booth and we found it easily. Uh, <laughs> outside of uh, Hamburg and the rest of the Stefan Feld collection, what other stuff would maybe you be showing off this year or what else do you want to talk about that people can look forward to soon? Yeah, sure. So uh, I mentioned Winter Kingdom. Winter Kingdom comes out. It would have been a Spiel release. Of course, that's another show that in another dimension we might have been able to go to. <laughs> yeah. But um, we would have had it at Gen Con for sure, showing it off. Uh, we demoed it as part of Gen Con, and it's available on the Tabletop Simulator Workshop. Um, we had a couple of games that came out earlier this year. One was called Zen Garden. It's an excellent tile laying game that has variability. You can choose the difficulty level by adding more tiers to the pagoda that kind of represents scoring options. Mm -hmm. um, that's also on the, the workshop. Um, there's some good coverage on it, but it came out right at the beginning and games that did that are just very hard to promote right now right we yeah. also had another game come out that we would have had there called way to go it's this light fun party game where you're trying to get your teammate to draw on a dry erase board down a complicated path and you have to communicate to them which way to move the pen and you have to do that without using Everybody has a restriction. Like I may not be able to talk. I can only touch you on the back or you may have to wear a mask so that you can't actually do anything or whatever it might be. It's the worst possible game to have brought out at the beginning of a pandemic. <laughs> uh, so we haven't even, uh, we've had one group review it. We haven't ever really been able to do much with it. Um, in addition to those uh, other Essen releases for us would have been the Merlin big box, uh, which is due to fulfill uh, this fall. And it's, it's a collection of all the Merlin parts plus a new uh, Morgana expansion, all put in a big box with a beautiful set of game trays, um, it, stuff to hold everything inside. And um, it, it's great. We've got um, a couple of Roll and Rights we did, one for Escape and one for Alhambra that are going to be Essen releases. Uh -huh. um, so we probably would have been playtesting and showing off both of those there. Um, I'm sure I'm overlooking. There's something. It's hard to keep track of all of them, but we would have had all of our Eston releases there, at least in prototype format, um, if not actual early early production copies. Yeah, there's a lot. I remember. Uh, I think we talked about it when it was first announced. The way to go, and it, that is, it is such a fun, funny concept. Uh, it's a shame that that's uh, harder to play right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we've got it once we get back to conventions and, and, you know, we're not really talking about the, when we do get back to conventions, people are going to behave differently, right? Things are going to change. It's going to be a long time before this gets out of people's minds. So when we get back to conventions and people are comfortable playing and things like that, we'll be, we'll be showing it to people. Who knows? Maybe you can use that to make a weird digital version that's like people are on their phones and like one person can only talk in emojis or something. And <laughs> there you go. That's 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 super interesting. Did you guys I know you guys do a lot of role playing stuff, too, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Did, we try. did you see the role playing game that was recently on Kickstarter? They ran it as part of Gen Con where the party is together, but they can only communicate via text messages. Oh, it was that Alice oh, is yeah. missing. Yes, I think I think so. Yes, yeah. yes. That looks super neat. I, I'd play that. Yeah, I love love concepts like that 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 do weird things like that, especially in the RPG world. There's interesting stuff you can do. So yeah, yeah, and yeah. Go it's ahead. neat to see. It's always neat to see something new and fresh, right? Because most things have been so rehashed over and over and over that new and fresh is great. Yes. Well, that's why Queen Games will deliver all the new and fresh titles <laughs> that you need. Uh, so the Stefan Feld City Collection, how long is that campaign going to be running for the first two games? It's going to run for about 20 days. Launches on, like I said, the 18th. So that plus 20 will be put it right around the beginning of September. And um, we always we use CrowdOx for late pledge. So if they miss it, they can get some of the stuff. But if you don't hit the campaign early, you're probably going to miss out on some of the things because mm. they are limited, some of them. Well, we will have a link to that in our description down below. Is there anywhere else people can follow you and Queen Games and other things going on besides that Kickstarter page? Yeah, we have a dedicated U.S. or slash English Twitter and Facebook page. So they can check us out there and they can always find all of our products and various news in the U.S. on queengames.shop. 
Very good. Go look for that stuff and check out that uh, Stefan Feld City collection and get in there early. Again, if you want the, you know, if you need that specific number <laughs> for your set, <laughs> uh, get, a, get a lock on that. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us, Travis. It's been a lot of fun getting some of this behind the scenes into uh, what's been going on in terms of games and conventions. And hopefully we'll get to talk to you again in the future and, uh, you know, learn more. Is there's always There always seem to be more Queen games coming out. You don't run out of them. <laughs> we well, yeah, well, you know, we ex- we accept submissions both in the U.S. and Germany, um, and we have a stable of designers who have been doing stuff for us for a while. So we do have a lot to choose from, and we we do put out a number of games. So that's it is guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, guys, thanks a lot for having me. Um, I'd love to come back sometime and be just talk about. Uh, different role-playing games and stuff that's kind of my route so oh sure anytime you want to chat role-playing games let me know sounds a lot of, of fun maybe we'll, maybe we'll have a have you on for a an rpg we'll play something together <laughs> yeah that sounds great all right perfect well I look forward to that uh this has been a roll for crit interview and thanks everybody for watching bye <laughs> <laughs> We want you to like and subscribe, and if you have the chance, take a look at our Patreon. Thank you for being a friend. Subscribe to our channel and back again. Okay. (laughs)